Welcome to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton. My name's Ellis Nordhoff, and today I'm joined by Sim from We Are Tottenham TV to do a scout report on Arno Danjuma. How are you, Sim? Thanks for having me on, Ellis. I'm doing well, thank you. We're not going to gazump you this time, I promise, although can there are no guarantees. Oh, it's a dramatic one, isn't it? There's loads to talk about with that Dan Juma story because probably one of the most controversial transfers in Everton's history, to be honest. It left us in complete shock, but I'll start with how he's done for you guys because he did end up joining Tottenham instead of Everton and he played 12 games for you last season, scored two goals, a bit of a bit part role really in the Tottenham side. So I don't know how much you actually have to say about him, but what were your thoughts on his time at the club? I think a bit part is probably an understatement, to be honest, because I think he started one game in the uh, Premier League against Brentford, which was our last home game of the season. Uh, I think he got taken off, taken off after an hour. He actually scored on his debut um, against Preston in the FA Cup. I and remember we thought, that. Okay, uh, yeah, he, he came... Um, he only came on for a few for like 20 minutes and it didn't take him long to score. And it looked like we'd actually got a really good signing. But for one reason or another, Conte just didn't fancy him at all. Um, he actually um, said in a press conference after about a month uh, of Dan Juma being at Spurs that Dan Juma didn't suit what um, Con- how Conte wanted to play. And he didn't. He said he saw... Um, Dan Juma is more of a winger and he wanted more of a forward, which is quite interesting because I think Dan Juma is more of a forward than a winger. So I thought that was quite contradictory. So maybe they just didn't get on. I think Conte didn't like the fact, I think, that Dan Juma, I think, was like thrust upon him. I don't think Conte really wanted him. I think he was a signing that um, Tottenham saw an opportunity, basically, to get a, a a, a player of Dan Juma's caliber for a loan fee of rel- relatively little risk. So I think they just took the opportunity and I don't think he was one that Conte specifically wanted. But in terms of how he performed at, when he got a chance, I thought he was bright. He was clearly very good dribbling. He's very quick. He's a tricky customer. I thought he actually did himself proud when like, whenever he was given the opportunity. But unfortunately for him, he really rarely got chances. He barely played. And I like if you ask any Tottenham fan, no one can really tell you why, because we had players um, in similar positions who were continuously out of form. Kulisevsky was out of form for a long time. Son, as you, as you well know, like he had a really mixed bag last season. For a long stretch, um, he wasn't playing very well. Uh, Richarlison um, wasn't able to um, get any sort of form going last season as well. And for one reason or another, he just refused to pay Dan Juma. And I can't really I can't really tell you the reason for that. Quite a weird one, that, because from the outside, you think, did he struggle to settle maybe? And obviously, with the circumstances of the move, it seemed to probably be a surprise to Conte, surprise to Everton, surprise to Tottenham. It was just a, a crazy circumstance, wasn't it, really? He was at the club... He'd, he'd done his medical, he'd, the media stuff was done as well. There's actually photos of him in an Everton shirt, which haven't been released, but that did happen. He did meet some of the players, allegedly, and he ended up going to Tottenham. So obviously it left us fans absolutely devastated because we feel like we obviously needed him more than you guys, as it proved in the end. But yeah, being at Tottenham, obviously you say he didn't play much, you say Conte perhaps didn't fancy him. So do you not think there was any sort of issue with Dan Juma settling himself? Was it more purely about Conte or do you think it could have been something with Dan Juma's personality or character? I don't think he actually struggled to sell. I think he got on really well with his teammates and I think the fans took to him very quickly. I think the fans were desperate for him to get more game time and for him to do well. There was clearly something with him and Conte about uh, about why he wasn't being picked. I you, I think Conte is a very political manager and he make and he a lot of the times he'll make deci- um, make decisions to make a point. He'll say things to make a point. For example, uh, right at the beginning of the season, we signed Jed Spence and um, just after we signed him, um, he said on the preseason tour, oh, Jed Spence, he's a club signing. And then um, Jed Spence was definitely signed by Levy to like be our right wing back. And 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 Conte basically decided, I didn't pick this player, I'm not going to play him. And he either you said about a loan or he's going to rot away. And he basically didn't play him for six months until he went on loan um, in January. So I think it's a similar situation with Dan Juma. I think Dan Juma was forced upon him. And I think he Pacey didn't play him to make a statement. I don't think it's anything to do with the quality of Dan Juma. I think he was a fine player. I I personally think he would have suited how Conte wants to play. I think he would have been perfect for that inside left forward role. But he just he just refused to play him. I think it was a political decision because, as I say, when he got time, he was good. I thought he played really well when he got the little time he got on the pitch. Um, he was he was one of the only players who actually seemed to be able to beat a man. Like we had no dribblers in our team. He scored uh, he scored two goals. One of them. Uh, both of them, sorry, one of them against um, 
uh, you know, we lost uh, th- to Bournemouth at home. He was a substitute. He literally came on for five minutes and he was one of our best players even in that game and scored a really nice goal. And he scored against Preston. Um, he literally, but whenever Conte did play him, it was really harsh. He literally gave him less than five minutes at the end of the games to try and impress. And he did impress. He scored a goal. And, uh, and, he was able to make a bit of an impact, but it's difficult when you're getting such little game time. And um, I think it, I think it was I think he can probably look at Conte and um, as a really big reason as to why that it went wrong for him. And I think that the fans got no problem with him. He did a nice statement um, after he left, you know, thanking the fans for their support and welcoming him to the club. But he obviously didn't mention Conte, and I think I, th- I just think it was a political thing between Conte and the club as to why it didn't really work out. I'm sure you're right about the Conte thing. He's known to be quite stubborn, isn't he? And like you say about Jed Spence, quite a similar situation where players can just get ousted by him, can't they? And you never see them again. And you touched on him playing left forward and that's kind of the role you'd have wanted him to play. What positions do you think he can play? I'm sure he didn't get a chance to show his whole ability during his time at Tottenham, but what positions do you think suited him and where did he play when you guys had him? Um, so when we had him, he played majority, yeah, left inside forward. Obviously, we played the three four three system. So I think he had a couple of minutes of wing back as well, knowing Conte. Wow. That, you know, he, he does he does wing is he do, he does that to wingers sometimes. But that was very that was very rare. Um, he in, I think in his first start, his only start, which was Brentford at home and near the end of the season, he played a right wing. And he played quite well, but I don't think he that's his natural position. I think he likes to cut in, get shots off. And I think on the right wing, he was quite good at taking someone on, but he wasn't really able to really affect the game in the final third. And I think even before the hour mark, he was taken off. Um, but I think definitely left wing is his best position. I know for Villarreal, when we uh, we when we signed him, we, I was looking at some Villarreal and a lot of the times he was they play a 4-4-2, maybe similar to what Sean Dyche might play. And he were a lot of a lot of the time was playing as a, one of the two up top. And we thought maybe he could fill in as one of the, maybe in the th- when we sometimes play 3-5-2, we're thinking he could sometimes fill in in the striking position, but he never really did that for us. But I think that's definitely a position he did really well for Villarreal. It's interesting because when you see him joining the club, it's like you had Richarlison, Son, Kane, Kulisevsky, all these players It. I didn't know where he was going to fit in and in the end it kind of proved that he didn't quite fit in because he didn't get much game time. But it's interesting what you say about him sometimes playing on the right wing but not often because in our situation we've got Dwight McNeil at left wing who had a great end to the season, hopefully another great season for him next year. But if he's competing with Dan Juma for that left wing role, I imagine he'd lose it. So it's good to know that he can play on both sides but I imagine his strength is the left, like you say, and What you say about him playing up front, actually, it could be really beneficial to us because you know that we don't have loads of funds this summer and to have a a versatile player like it seems like he is, is good because if he can play in multiple positions, then that adds, it kind of makes him more than the value of one player by being able to play multiple positions. And do you think that versatility is important for a team like Everton? Yeah, I think for definitely for a team like Everton, if you're, you need players who can play multiple positions. I think that's definitely true, especially in the position you're in. What I would say about him playing up front is I wouldn't, um, unless you're playing like maybe, if I remember right, how you played against like um, Brighton very much on the counter attack when you had the very impressive performance, uh, um, we beat them 5-1, you were very much using the space that Brighton left. But I wouldn't, usually see him as a lone striker. I think he needs a partner. I don't think he's very good at holding the ball up and that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't want him as a lone striker, but definitely as a striker as part of a two. I think if you partnered him with Cavalloon up front in a 4 2 I think definitely that could work. Um, and I I think um, if need be, for sure, he can fill in in other positions. As I say, he even had a few minutes of wing back, so I wouldn't put it past Sean Dyche if you're desperate to maybe put him there. Imagine that. I really hope it doesn't get to that. Hopefully he sticks to the front three, <laughs> one of the three positions. I don't want to see him at win back at all, but you've mentioned a few things about his ability and I don't know how well he performed at week, uh, wing back or whatever, but I want to know what he's good at and what he's not good at. So we'll start with the strengths. We'll start positively. What would you say are Dan Juma's best abilities? What is he absolutely best at in that Tottenham team and hopefully in the Everton team if he joins? Yeah, definitely his ability to take people on, his dribbling ability. That was what that was the shining light at his time at Tottenham. In the very few minutes we saw him, that was what he was pretty much brought on to do. Um, and I think he brings like that excitement, a bit of electricity when he's on the ball. Um, he, he can go kind of on the left or the right. He doesn't mind when he's dribbling as well. So I think I think that's his biggest asset, his pace and his ability to take people on. 
that's absolutely what we want because we need players who are explosive. We've lacked pace for years now. So to have a player that kind of excites the fans, gets people off the seats, it's, it's what you want, isn't it? But if we look at his negatives, what is he struggling at? If you're looking at Dan Juma and going, he's not too great at that part because the you know, weaknesses could show up quite a lot in a possibly struggling team. Is there anything that's glaring or is he just quite a good all round player? I would say um, his decision-making in the final third wasn't the best when it came to linking up the play, kind of, um, you know, getting, trying to get assists or like keep like creating chances. He was more of a, he was more of a forward who likes to get on, get, get in behind and get on the end of things and try and score rather than set chances up for his teammates. He wasn't one to like get to the byline, put crosses in with any real quality in that set, in that sense. So um, what I would say is, he's not one who's a chance creation machine. He's more of a one who's a goal scorer. So I think his decision-making chance creation is something he needs to work on for sure. Right. That's interesting because that seems like he's a bit of a selfish player, but if he's scoring goals, that's massively important for us. And we need goals. That's the main target in this transfer window, just bring goals in. And he seems to be capable of doing that, but looking at his character has been a few question marks over that. People are a bit concerned about how he is as a guy and, there's been obviously the situation in January where he didn't join us. So a few people are worried about his attitude. What would you say to Everton fans who've got a few questions about him as a character? I think he seemed to be really good um, character in the dressing room. I think he seemed to get on with all the all his teammates. I didn't see I didn't see him as a bad egg or someone who had attitude problem. I think he's massively regret, regretting his move to Tottenham. To be honest, in terms of what how it panned out, I think he really. I think I was actually um, discussing his transfer on a transfer update we did the other day, and we were talking about he was um, he had potential offers from AC Milan and Everton, and and uh, we're thinking who would be the best move for him. And I said I think it's probably best for him just to go to Everton because. Because the last season he's had, with the amount of time he played at Tottenham, he needs to go to a team not where he's the main man again, where everything goes through him, and he needs to feel important again. And I think Everton, that's exactly what's going to happen. He's going to be a, your star player. He's going to feel like uh, really important to the team. And I think that's where he thrives. That's where you really see the best of him. So I think, I think you got. I don't think attitude problems. You got any problem with? You should have any problems with him, to be honest. I think he's going to be a good character, and I think all the Everton players are going to um, take to him, in my opinion, and the, and the fans. I think so. I don't think he's got an attitude problem. That's good to hear, really. And I have heard him actually say before about how when he goes on the football pitch, it's war, and that's very much reminiscent of what the Everton fans think. They want the players to go on the pitch and die for the shirt and really just commit everything they have. And it sounds like he's willing to do that. And like you say, it could be the right move for him. Do you think joining Everton at this time, at this stage of his career, 26 years old, is this his chance to kind of bring a bit of a resurgence about in his career in a time where it's perhaps stagnated a bit? I think so. I think, I th as I said, I think it's a good move for him. I think he needs to reignite his career. Um, he had a really good season at Villarreal, but then um, the new manager, Emery got sacked and the new manager came in and um, he wasn't, he was out of favour. And then he came to Tottenham and then for one reason or another, for more political reasons, in my opinion, then performance reasons, he wasn't getting a look in. So I think for someone like Dan Juma, who was on a really good trajectory, um, you know, Villarreal got to the semi-finals. He was quite a big part of that. He scored goals against like Bayern Munich in the quarterfinals. Um, so I think, I think going to a team like Everton, where he, I think even your style of play is going to suit him, like being more um, transitional, more on the counter attack, where he's going to have to exploit the space. I think that's going to really suit a play like Dan Juma. So I think it's a really good move for him. Um, I think he's gonna, it's going to suit the way he plays, and so I think it's a good move all round. I'm pleased to hear that you actually do think he'd suit the style because I imagine a lot of fans who perhaps aren't as clued up on Everton's style of play might think, oh, is Dan Juma really going to enjoy playing in a Sean Dyche system? And stereotypically, everyone says Sean Dyche is defensive football and it doesn't really give the attackers the freedom. But actually what we've noticed is getting the ball from back to front as quick as possible is the priority. And like you say, transitional play. And for pe for players with pace and explosive tendencies like Dan Juma has, he could be massively useful for us on the counter-attack. And yeah. if Calvert-Lewin does stay fit all season, you could have a great pair in there as well. And two players who can actually get goals. So I think it would be a good signing for Everton. Would you say then it's definitely a good sign and no-brainer? I think so. And also, if you look at the wingers that Everton have, like McNeil, uh, Damari Gray, I mean, you had Andros Townsend, but he's left now. They're much more 
wingers who like the ball to feet. They like to get on the ball and and kind of um, take people on and kind of get shots off, get shots off that way. Whereas Dan Juma is much more likely to be a player who runs in behind and exploits the space that way. And I think that's definitely a, a um, something in your armory that you're missing. And I think it's he get off for something that you don't have right now. I think it ups the quality in the wide areas. I think it's a great signing for Everton, in my opinion. That's definitely what we need. We need that player to go and pick the ball up and carry it because there has been a bit of concerns over Damari Gray. When he gets hold of the ball, he doesn't always charge it. You'd think a player with so much pace would do that, but he doesn't. He often slows the game down. So I could actually see Damari Gray going out the door and Dan Juma coming in as a replacement. And depending on how he does this season, I don't know what fee Villarreal would be commanding, but they seem to be completely done with him, don't they? Yeah, I think we had a, Spurs had an option of about 25 million euros to sign him permanently. We didn't take it up. So I I don't know if you've got an option in the deal that you're doing, but I'm assuming it's going to be in that ballpark. Yeah, according to everybody at the minute, there isn't an option. It is just a straight loan deal. I imagine to kind of protect us a bit in case it doesn't go well, there's, there's definitely no obligation, which was the talk six months ago. So thankfully, there's nothing we've got to commit to, but... Yeah, I'm really hoping he can do well for us because we just need to add goals to that side. And I think he could be the quality player that we need. But that completes our scout report on our out Jan Juma. It's been great. Thanks for coming on, Sim. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's all for now, though. See you later.